later on. My biggest fear, I think, is that if the economy slips into recession, right, and you have a scenario where Hello everyone, today our guest is Gareth Soloway. In this video, Gareth Soloway talks about the stock market, the dollar's strength and potential weakness, Fed's planning for the future and discussion and price prediction on Bitcoin, both short and long term. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. The Bitcoin price chart from the past couple of months reflects nothing more than a bearish outlook, and it's no secret that the cryptocurrency has consistently made lower lows since breaching $48,000 in late March. Curiously, the difference in support levels has been getting wider as the correction continues to drain investor confidence and risk appetite. For example, the latest $19,000 baseline is almost $10,000 away from the previous support. So, if the same movement is bound to happen, the next logical price level would be $8,000. On July 11, the Financial Stability Board, a global financial regulator including all G20 countries, announced that a framework of recommendations for the crypto sector is expected in October. To date, investors still haven't figured out the total losses from deposits on crypto lenders Celsius and Voyager Digital, and both firms continue to seek either a recovery plan or bankruptcy. According to Voyager, the firm still holds $650 million worth of claims against 3 Eros Capital, so the exact numbers of customer assets remain unknown. Regulatory pressure is unlikely to recede in the short term, and at the same time, there's not much that the Federal Reserve can do to suppress inflation without triggering some form of an economic crisis. For this reason, pro-traders are not rushing to buy the dip because Bitcoin's correlation to traditional assets remains high. You know, it's tough to know. It's, it's looking at the commodity prices and trying to gauge when they started to fall and then how long does it take to pass through to the consumer. So I guess I would say I'm not super surprised but I do think that this is the top on CPI readings. And I do think that by next month, you're gonna have this full month plus of oil falling, copper falling, I mean, all these other um, commodities just collapsing pretty dramatically. And that probably starts to show at least next month, a slight downtick. Yeah, and I think, I think also to keep in mind, I think you can see the stock market reacting today. Like there were a lot of individual investors and I saw it on my Twitter feed today that when that print came out, they were kind of, oh my goodness, the end of the world. And you saw the markets initially get crushed. We saw a big gap down, but the market started to recognize exactly what we've just said, which is this is peak inflation. All right, this is as high as it's going to get at least in the near term. Now it doesn't mean, and I think you would agree, we're not going back to 2%. I mean, that's that's not happening for a long, long time, if ever. But it's, it's the market wants that little bit of, of hope. And just to see that number down ticking, which if you look at any commodities out there, you should see that next month. Yeah, I think the thinking out there is this is probably peak. And like you said, it could take a year to 18 months to get inflation back under control. Forget two yeah. percent. I don't think you might you know, maybe two years to get back down there, but we might see four to six percent within twelve to eighteen months potentially. Yeah, that's what I'm. I'm in the camp that, that it's going to be kind of that four to five percent range. It's going to come into, and, and then unfortunately, the metrics that the Fed is taking to control it will then probably cause a slowdown that that might start to get out of control a little bit by the Fed. And then the question is, at a four to five percent handle on inflation. Does the Fed start to say, okay, we need to start to loosen policy because unemployment is now seven or eight or 10%. And I think that's what investors have to watch. Not so much this year, I would expect that more to be an issue next year. So on that note, what are you looking at for the Fed? You think 75 or 100? I'm in the camp of 75. I know, I believe it or not, I even heard 150 basis points today, but I think that's ludicrous. Um, I think even 100 is a little excessive considering the signals. I mean, the Fed has to be looking at it like we're looking at it. At least I really hope they do. Um, otherwise, you really start to wonder about the Federal Reserve where you know they see the economy starting to slow. Um, they see these commodities coming down, uh, which are gauges of economic growth, as well as projections on for forecasting economic growth. And they have to be saying, OK, you know, let's stick with 75 basis points and then we can reevaluate. Because I think after this Fed meeting, there's not another one till September. So that would be my guess is they kind of go back into that wait and see mode and then see where we are uh, then.
One other thing I wanted to mention is people aren't talking about it, but really watch the CP uh, the PPI number tomorrow. And the reason I mentioned the PPI number is because it's producer. So, so the way inflation works is the, the triggers first occur on the producer side, the producer then passes it to the consumer. So it could be possible that we could see a slight downtick in the PPI tomorrow, which would then filter through to the consumer next month. And it's just something interesting. I don't know if that will happen, but it is a possibility. Um, and again, that's just something no one's talking about tomorrow in terms of that PPI number actually being pretty big because it is a kind of a forecaster for the CPI. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be a good indicator. And then of course we have earnings coming out next week. And oh, you know, yeah. earnings are, you know, backward looking, <laughs> but the guidance, that'll be interesting in terms of what, you know, everybody's seeing, you know, for guide future future guidance. Yeah, I think JP Morgan reports tomorrow, the bank stocks are later this week, the rest of them. Um, and then I think ne next week we have Netflix, IBM usually reports that next week. And then then after that, you get into the craziness of Apple and all, I mean, and that Apple is gonna be fascinating, right? Because you're really talking supply chain, you're talking about su su uh, demand for their products. I mean, there's so many things in that stock that we'll know about the economy and the consumer as a whole, not just domestically, but globally. We know they have a huge footprint in China as well. But I was looking at the dollar, right? And the dollar has been screaming, and we can take a look at the DXY, and the DXY was right into major resistance here. So here's your DXY chart. And again, look at this beautiful reversal on the dollar today after initially popping up. But if you go to a larger time frame, let's go to the monthly, what you can see here is you have two trend lines that are converging right at the high on the dollar here. So big, big resistance on the dollar. And again, for me at least, this was a signal that an overbought dollar with peak inflation, and again, we've known that with inflation, the dollar's actually strengthened, it likely starts to come back in here as the Fed may not have to tighten quite as much if we do see peak inflation. So everything that was kind of you know, the dollar has been crushing the stock market. We've seen it crush commodities. So I was I was looking out there across the board at so many different things from tech stocks to gold to silver, all those types of things uh, in terms of looking for some opportunities this morning. We've been down into this 2017 high, right? I mean, we've been below it a little bit. We've been above it a little bit. Um, as of yesterday, we were below. Now we're back above today. And here's that line right there. But I think people were, were not, most crypto investors, all they do is focus on crypto. And again, I think that's my stock background has been very good for kind of seeing the bigger macro picture. And you have to understand that if the dollar wasn't surging, I think crypto would be much, much higher than it is right now. And if the dollar is topping and you can already see the reversal in crypto as the dollar's fallen today, I think crypto has upside. I'm still in, in, in the case here where my midterm outlook is still down, but my near term outlook is, is to the upside. I think we take out the short term highs of 22. And I think you're probably headed back to at least 25.5 here. Um, and that's assuming the dollar really has topped and starts to come in over the next couple of weeks. No, I think I think the markets already already kind of have the game plan here. And I think that's the amazing thing that most investors have to understand is that, you know, by the time that CPI came out this morning, the markets, the algorithms reacted and the small investors reacted. But smart money was just buying hand over fist because they were already saying, OK, that number's over. Now we're looking to next month. Right. And I think the same thing with the Federal Reserve is the, the markets are already seeing the odds. Right. So high percentage of 75 lower percentage of, of 100, the markets are already saying, okay, well, if they do 100, maybe that's good news because they're going to then go on hold maybe all the way till after the midterms. And then who knows, maybe the economy, maybe inflation is so much lower, then they don't feel like they have to continue to raise so aggressively. And so I think that's the way the market looks at it. And I think we could actually be up for a little bit of a summer rally now, um, even if the Fed hikes 75 basis points or 100 basis points. It's definitely a possibility. I would still handicap it as the least likely scenario for me. Um, just like always, I, I'm always fully aware that anything can happen, right? I mean, we could go lower, we could go straight up, but but ultimately, there's still too much junk in the system. And we've seen, you know, we've seen bankruptcies, we've seen Terra Luna kind of collapse and all these other things. But I, I don't think, I mean, for me, I still look at how many cryptocurrencies are out there. That's still problematic to me. Like how the heck can there still be over 10,000 or 15 or 20,000 cryptocurrencies? Where does the washout finally occur? And so it, it would be hard for me to imagine that we're really done here, especially because of this, right? So think about this. Previous cycles have always had the Fed helping by printing. 
This is the first cycle we don't. So the, the common, the logic would dictate this would be the worst of all the cycles versus the best of all of them. Now, granted, you do have more adoption, so I think you have to factor that in. Um, maybe if regulation came out, I think that could be a possible major positive as well. But I'm still in the camp. I, I got to think that we're headed lower after we get some sort of uptick here. So let's say the price gets driven down to 12,000 or 10,000 on Bitcoin, which I don't know where Michael Saylor's margin calls come in. I know he has leveraged out a little bit, but that would be the other thing that would be really scary. Like if we started to break, let's say the 17.5 low, where is his point where where MicroStrategy has some issues there? I don't know. I don't remember. I, initially, I heard it was around 21,000, and then I think he kind of updated it and said it was lower than that. But that would just be something else to kind of keep in mind is that when you have an illiquid asset like Bitcoin, if any of these, I mean, did you hear about Mt. Gox, right? So apparently they have 150,000 Bitcoin that might get unloaded. Now, market doesn't care about that right now. But if we were to get another leg down, do these margin calls, bankruptcies, all these factors start to kind of trickle through? So I could almost be on your page where maybe this is a bottom if we don't go at all any lower that would trigger more bankruptcies, which would be more liquidations and, and those. But if we do take out 17.5, that's where I would get real nervous, minimum going down to 12,000, maybe even sub 10 later on. My biggest fear, I think, is that if the economy slips into recession, right? and you have a scenario where risk assets take another hit because of that so let's say earnings start to really suffer you know maybe people start to fret about it's going to be worse than a recession but maybe like a great depression or or even a great recession like we had in 08 09 does that deleveraging then even take bitcoin down with it like it has now over the past you know year Cointelegraph contributor Michael Van de Pop, however, there was still reason to believe that selling pressure was circumstantial rather than a longer-term trend. Yes, the markets should have been correcting, but right now, the valuations of crypto and Bitcoin are way lower than what they should be due to forced selling from 3AC, Dollar Luna, and more, he argued. That's why a break through $22K is going to accelerate the price to $30K as well. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.